This message is on the winning attitude of positive self-control. Positive self-control is the attitude that you take the responsibility for causing your own effects in life. It's a very important theme because losers let it happen and winners make it happen. And when you're able to understand this attitude, you'll have the key to decision-making or making up your mind on your goals easily and effectively. Because winners first want to win, then they discover that they're in control of making it happen. And all the images and all the goals that they've set become more easily obtained because they realize that they're driving. My own motto in life is that life is a do it with God, do it for others, do it to myself program. The true meaning of self-control is often misunderstood. Many people interpret self-control as getting a good grip on yourself or remaining cool under pressure. But self-control as it relates to the psychology of winning is synonymous with responsibility. Winners take full responsibility for their own lives. They believe in cause and effect, and they have that wonderful philosophy that life is a do-it-to-yourself program. Self-control implies freedom for individuals to choose among many alternatives and to shape their own destinies. I know many people who believe that fate or luck or possibly their astrological signs, have shaped the outcome of their lives. And these underachievers are people who feel that life is mostly determined by circumstance or predestination or being at the right place at the right time. And they're more likely to give in to doubt and fear and to be wishy-washy and indecisive in the face of a decision that could have led them to true success in their lives. People who are aware that they exert control over what happens to them in life are happier, and they're able to choose more appropriate responses to what occurs. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, there's a story of the sacred custom called the escaped goat. When the troubles of the people became overwhelming, a healthy male goat was brought into the temple. In a solemn ceremony, the highest priest of the tribe placed his hands on the head of the goat and recited a long list of problems and woes. Having all the problems of the people thus transmitted onto the goat, the goat was then set free to run away, taking all the troubles with him. That was about 4,000 years ago, but the term scapegoat that came from that ancient ceremony still is in full force today. Blaming external forces is as old as the earth, but stays consistently young. After Adam ate of the apple, he quickly pointed at Eve and said, The woman whom you put here with me made me do it. Some people blame their parents, the government, the high deficit, the immigrants for doing higher quality work for lesser pay. They blame their companies, and specifically they blame their bosses. Instead of working on what is going on inside of them, they try to blame that which is around them. It's always easier and more convenient to assume the answer lies elsewhere or with others. If I've learned anything in life, it's God's unfailing boomerang, which is what goes around comes around. And that which you send out, you will surely get back in the long run. I've never told a lie that didn't eventually haunt me or hurt me. And I've never done a good deed that didn't help me or heal me in some way. We're not responsible for what happens out there, for what others do or think, but we are responsible only for how we choose to respond. That's our attitude. The responsibility for us is ours. If it is to be, it's up to me. And those people who cannot make up their minds for fear of making the wrong choice, vacillating in indecision, they simply don't meet their goals, which is a requisite for success. Rather, they take their place among the rank and file of the also-rans, and they trudge along in bland mediocrity. When you know where you're going, and you know that you're driving, you can make decisions quickly and easily. And because of this one fact... The winners in life seem to have their minds made up automatically. They're propelled forward without hesitation because they and everyone else involved with them know where they're going and know that nothing is permitted to block their path. All individuals are what they are and where they are because of a composite of all of their own doings at one time or another in their lives. And although their innate characteristics and environment are given to them initially, the decisions that they make determine whether they actually win or lose their particular game of life. Voltaire likened life to a game of cards. Each player must accept the cards that life deals him or her. But once in hand, 
He or she alone must decide how to play the cards in order to win the game. The writer John Erskine put it a little differently when he wrote, Though we sometimes speak of a primrose path, we all know that a bad life is just as difficult, just as full of work, obstacles, and hardships as a good one. The only choice is the kind of life one would care to spend one's efforts on. Whether you're a bum on skid row or a high achiever or a happy individual, you can pat yourself on the back, taking the credit or the blame for your place. We took over from our parents at a much younger age than we thought, and we've been in the driver's seat ever since. You know, I didn't realize until I was about 30 that I'm behind the wheel in my life. I thought it was my genes, my horoscope, and my childhood. I should have taken a hint from my daughter when she was only 11 months old. I was a headstrong Navy fighter pilot, used to wear my silver blue flight suit to mow the lawn so the neighbors would know that a Rambo type was living next door. I used to go out in the freeway in my Porsche Targa looking for Honda Civics to intimidate. I wore my flight helmet with a bolt of lightning painted on it in the car on the freeway, and I'd love to ride the bumper of the car in front of me, pretending I was a Blue Angel flying formation in an air show. I'll never forget that evening when I swaggered into my kitchen in full flight gear to greet my wife and kids, who I thought would be impressed seeing their warrior in his war games uniform. I always wore a gun in my holster with my flight suit, in case I was shot down in a real war and taken prisoner. I figured I'd shoot my way out to freedom. Well, I'm sure you get the picture of a former chauvinist who believed that he was the boss of the house. But then I've always learned the hard way. My 11-month-old younger daughter, Dana, was in her high chair, supposedly eating Gerber's strained squash as the main course. Instead, the squash was in my wife's hair, all over my daughter's bib, and all over the floor. What's going on in here, I growled, putting my flight helmet on the table. It looks like the Vietnam War in here. My wife smiled and said, she doesn't like Gerber's strained squash, so I'm giving her applesauce for nourishment. I couldn't believe she said that. Give me that squash, I said. She eats what we give her. I was raised during the post-depression years, and we were taught to clean our plate. She eats what we give her. Besides, she doesn't have taste buds yet. I took the squash, telling my wife that I'd take charge and get this simple exercise over with. I told my daughter to open up. Her gums clamped shut. I ate several bites as a role model and made slurping approving noises. I nearly gagged. It wasn't that great tasting, but I didn't let on. I told my daughter, It's delicious. Daddy loves it. Her defiant look said it all. It was that go-ahead-fat-so-you-finish-it look. Well, I'd had about enough. I asked my wife to leave the room, and being in total control of the situation, I pressed her cheeks firmly together with my two fingers, and I forced her mouth open. I laughed at my own take-command success. I then neatly inserted several spoonsful of squash into her mouth, and I held it shut, like every good father would do. Go ahead and swallow it, I ordered. I'm holding on until you do. She made a decision at 11 months old. She decided to die by holding her breath rather than swallow. I totally lost control and exploded. Go ahead and die. You're not the only child. Before you die, you'll swallow. And I glared back at her, pinching her mouth shut even more firmly. She made a second decision. She decided to make a squash transfer. As I squeezed tightly, I could feel the pressure build up in her cheeks like Mount St. Helen. I had created the nozzle effect, and like linear acceleration, a steady stream of propelled squash came out the compressed opening in her mouth and up my nose, deep into my nasal pituitary area, and I stopped breathing. I bellowed like a bull and fell convulsing on the floor in my flight suit. My wife, hearing the commotion, tiptoed back in and smiled sweetly. What happened, Top Gun, she said. I said, nothing. She doesn't like strained squash. Don't make a big deal about it. You see, my daughter had decided very early in life that she didn't like squash and wouldn't eat it. She's grown up now and flown the nest. But to this day, she doesn't like the taste of any kind of squash. But then, that's her choice, isn't it? You know, many children learn how to control their parents' lives as well, long before they learn how to talk in complete sentences. If whining gets attention and goodies, the whining continues. Children always do that for which they're rewarded. I saw a five-year-old boy terrorist on a recent flight. He wouldn't sit down in his seat with his seatbelt fastened until his mother and his father gave him their two pieces of chocolate cake for dessert, too. But you and I are not victims of the winds of fate. We are steering our ships. 
We are not puppets dangling from the strings of our heredity and environment. I know many individuals who have to work late all the time, as if the company or their bosses made them. You and I decide to work late sometimes because there are important things we want to get done. People who have to do things usually resent doing them, but they're not happy doing them, and they're not effective performers or producers. If you feel you have to do anything in life, in that sense, you're irresponsible in that act. Responsible self-control is the path to mental health and frequently to physical health as well. Current research into biobehavior and biofeedback programs has verified the human potential for the control of body functions and brainwave emissions. Through specialized training and discipline, it's possible and maybe even practical for us to control our pulse rate, our threshold of pain, our brainwave frequencies, and other body functions as a means of positive health maintenance for the future. Today, clinics throughout the world are teaching people how to raise their body temperature to help prevent the onset of a migraine headache, how to dilate their arteries to permit a greater blood flow to the heart, and how to relax muscles and nerve endings. I worked with Olympic athletes to help them prepare for peak performance using a combination of biofeedback and guided imagery. The next generation of astronauts who will build our permanent space stations in new orbiting cities, they're training their minds to prevent the onset of motion sickness that is common on space flights due to zero gravity conditions that are present during travel in outer space. You know, you and I exert much more voluntary control over what we thought were involuntary body functions and events in life than we ever imagined. This is known as responsibility psychology, and it fits right in with our own spiritual beliefs and sowing and reaping. It holds that irresponsibility and valuelessness lead to abnormal behavior, neuroses, and mental deterioration. The treatment for individuals suffering from these symptoms includes showing them that they need not be hung up on the past, but are responsible for their present actions as well as their future behavior. When neurotic individuals are helped to assume personal responsibility, the prognosis for recovery is good. So the winning human beings realize that everything in life is volitional. Even being alive is a choice. Everything in life you and I decide to do because it is profitable to those we care about and good for ourselves. Some choose evil. Some choose good. Some choose pleasure without purpose. Others choose purpose which brings pleasure and well-being. You don't have to work. You can choose revolving unemployment or handout. You don't have to pay taxes. You can live in a tax haven or go to prison for tax evasion. You don't even have to fix dinner or have children or even get up in the morning. Many people do none of the above. You decide to do the things you do, not out of compulsion, but because they're beneficial to you and they're the best choices among the alternatives available to help you toward your goals. So the high achievers in life and the real winners are wide open to choices, and they constantly look for a better way to live. In his excellent book, Self-Renewal, John Gardner states that winning individuals do not leave the development of their potential to chance. They pursue it systematically, and they look forward to an endless dialogue between their potentialities and the claims of life. Not only the claims they encounter, but the claims they invent. And daily, thousands are finding that there's a bright new world out there to be discovered. And they're demonstrating the truth of Gardner's statement that we don't even know we've been in prison until we've broken out. We're not only victims of habit in a very real sense. Each of us becomes a prisoner of hundreds of restrictions of our own making. Teenagers have a strong need to conform to the standards of their group. While they may feel that their special way of grooming is an act of independence, on the contrary... Their styles and activities adhere very strictly to the peer group code. Those who refuse to be responsible for their own deeds, looking to others for their behavior cues, they've not reached responsible maturity. And unfortunately, many adults spend their entire lives at this level of immaturity. As we grow into adulthood, we make decisions that progressively narrow our opportunities and alternatives. We select only a few friends out of the thousands with whom we rub elbows every day. And these friends are usually people with whom we agree, and thus we limit the input of fresh ideas. We choose our educational level, which in turn determines to a great extent our jobs and our associates. 
and from day to day we seek the path of least resistance, comfortable in our safe, established ways. The responsible winners look to the shackles that they've placed on themselves by apathy and by lack of imagination, and in a moment of truth, they decry their predicament and make a declaration of independence. They assert their option to choose and assume their rightful role of personal responsibility. Famed anthropologist, sociologist, the late Margaret Mead, called personal responsibility our most important evolution, and the notion that we are the product of our environment our biggest sin. You know, there should be a statue of responsibility standing in San Francisco Bay to match the Statue of Liberty, because there can be no liberty or freedom without responsibility. We will be free only as long as we can use freedom responsibly. The law of cause and effect is forever the ruler in our lives. Here are some techniques for developing a winning attitude of positive self-control because it's so important to realize that you're driving. First, eliminate the words I have to and I can't from your vocabulary. Get rid of them. There's nothing you have to do. Second, list alternative choices to your current habits, especially those habits you don't care for. Put some new choices down on paper. Third, take the credit and the blame for your decisions openly, but especially take the credit because you got yourself there. Fourth, affirm the self-talk that my rewards in life will always match my service. And fifth, Learn how to relax and take more control of your body. Practice some deep relaxation methods and study and learn more about biofeedback techniques. Take greater voluntary control of your involuntary body functions. Learn how to relax your muscles to get rid of tension. Learn how to elevate your skin temperature to get rid of headaches. Learn how to relax and elevate your temperature to increase your blood flow and reduce your heart rate. And set a specific time each week to initiate some action letters and action phone calls in your own behalf. Because you see, the winners in life don't wait for invitations to succeed. They make them happen. In other words, losers do let it happen, and winners do make it happen. So put on paper and create your own horoscope for life. Positive self-control is the attitude that you take responsibility for causing your own effects in your life. A winning attitude of positive self-control leads to the action quality of positive self-discipline. Positive self-discipline is paying the price of winning, and the theme of positive self-discipline is practice, practice, practice. Winners practice positive self-discipline. Self-discipline puts your money where your mouth is. Self-discipline dares you to place a bet on yourself, and self-discipline begins where lip service ends. All of the other winning qualities in this program are absolutely worthless without positive self-discipline. Because you may be motivated by desire, you may feel you're in control, you may expect to go to the moon, you may even imagine yourself on the moon, but you'll never even visit a NASA exhibit without persistent self-discipline. It all seems so simple. You tell your little robot subconscious achievement mechanism, that you want a new self-image, and zap, just like a thermostat, up we go. Well, there's a little more effort involved because you've been like you are for some time now, in fact, most of your life. And every day, your actions and reactions usually confirm and support your current self-image. You see, you constantly talk to yourself every minute you're awake at about six to 800 words a minute, maintaining and justifying who you are today. This has been going on for years. Your little robot has matured into a whole control room full of some very big habits. And habits are the key, because habits start out as off-handed remarks, sometimes magazine ads or friendly hints, experiments. And like flimsy cobwebs with very little substance, 
They begin to grow, layer upon layer, thought upon thought, fused with imagination and emotion, until they become like unbreakable steel cables to shackle or strengthen our lives. Habits are the attitudes which grow from cobwebs into cables that control your everyday life. The theme of positive self-discipline is make winning your habit. Positive self-discipline alone can make or break a habit. Self-discipline alone can affect a permanent change in your self-image and in you. Many people have defined self-discipline as doing without. But a better definition of self-discipline is doing within when you're doing without. Because self-discipline is no more than mental practice the commitment to memory of those thoughts and emotions that will override current information stored in the subconscious memory bank. And through relentless repetition, these new inputs penetrate into our robot subconscious, resulting in the creation of a new self-image. The art of visualization or mental simulation is not a new concept at all. It's been around since the beginning of time because individuals have fantasized and acted out their whole life scripts in advance just like a movie right from the beginning. During the past decade, the art of visualization has become more sophisticated. From a simple concept of positive thinking to a highly technical approach complete with computerized digital and video simulation games and programs, current research confirms the incredible ability of the mind to achieve the currently dominant thought by instructing the body to carry out the vivid images of performance as if they'd been achieved before and are merely being repeated. One of the major reasons for many individuals failing to reach their goals is that they do not understand, and if they do, they're not willing to exercise the determination and self-discipline of practicing within when they're doing without. The keys to developing new attitudes, habits, and skills are, one, the commitment to memory, usually in a relaxed or meditating environment, those specific visualizations and accompanying emotions that can override current information stored in your subconscious robot. And two, through relentless repetition, again, again, and again, the penetration and storage of these new inputs into your robot self-image, resulting in the creation of a brand new self-image about that particular act. True self-discipline is telling yourself over and over with words, pictures, concepts, and emotions that you are winning each important victory now. So the winners practice in and out of the office and on and off the playing field. They learn new information, correct information, and then they visualize it and they simulate each experience they want to achieve. Every winner I've ever met in every walk of life, male or female, young or old, uses the technique of visualization or mental simulation every day in his or her imagination. As former chairman of our Olympic sports psychology program, I met a world champion Russian figure skater, and she told me, You know, Dennis, I rarely fall because I practice each sequence in my imagination at night with my eyes closed, and I could successfully perform my entire routine blindfolded without hesitation. From former Olympic skiing stars like Billy Johnson, Debbie Armstrong, and the Mayer Twins, to all of the marvelous European champions, they've all learned that mental simulation is an excellent way to practice skiing and gain confidence. In your mind, close your eyes, feet together, weight properly balanced, correct knee position, down the fall line, navigate the moguls, feel the crisp exhilaration, the wind, the speed, the open freedom of doing it all yourself. For champions, it's the winning edge. For beginners, it's a great way to conquer fear. After all, in your imagination, you never fall. All of the great golfers like Jack Nicklaus and Greg Norman and Pat Bradley and Kathy Baker, every time they miss a shot, they immediately replay it in their imagination. And tennis greats like Martina Navratilova and Boris Becker, they're simulation masters. You know, some time ago when Jack Nicklaus won the Masters Golf Tournament in his middle 40s, a veteran jockey was simulating while he watched Nicklaus and his son march up the 18th fairway toward the victory celebration in the coveted green jacket. As he watched the TV coverage, writing legend Willie Shoemaker said to himself, If Jack Nicklaus can win the Masters at his age, then I can reach inside myself and win the Kentucky Derby one more time at over 50 years of age. 
the simulation once again came true, as old Willie the Shoe stood in the real winner's circle in Louisville on Derby Day. So the winners in life simulate and practice winning. In other words, they take their successes and build on those. They practice as if they were first, even if their challenge is a first for mankind, because it gets to be a habit with them. The astronauts are the best living examples of winning self-discipline. I had the good fortune to study and observe the Apollo Moon Program astronauts, and I watched the crews playing Let's Pretend We're Going to the Moon. You see, no one had ever done it before. Who other than Jules Verne or Isaac Asimov really dreamed it possible? Astronauts spend years engaged in mental simulation. They practice bobbing up and down in a rubber life raft at sea, responding to the feeling of weightlessness so they'd be experienced in outer space. Then they went to the desert and practiced with a simulated lunar excursion module, as if they were landing it on the surface of the moon. Hour after hour, month after month, year after year, they memorized and simulated the exact theoretical steps with hundreds of critically vital sequences that NASA scientists had imagined and computed would take them safely to the moon and back. And then Neil Armstrong, after 300 practice sessions, took the first step and transmitted his reactions back to mission control in Houston. Houston, the eagle has landed. That's one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind. But he also radioed back, it was beautiful, just like our drills. You know, I remember sitting next to a woman on a recent flight to Chicago who was making a weird high-pitched humming sound with her eyes closed. I turned the overhead air nozzle on her face, and I asked her if she wanted me to call a stewardess to come to her aid. She retorted indignantly, I beg your pardon. I'm an oboist for a symphony orchestra, and I'm practicing for tonight's performance. I thought that was weird, but she thought I was weird for interrupting her. And she said, now if you'll excuse me, I'll continue the performance. Perhaps the most riveting example of winning self-discipline that I've ever seen has been exposed to you and me through the experience of our POWs returning from Vietnam. Through the joy and heart-rending tearful reunions with families those many years ago, did you come to understand the self-discipline in action? Did you hear or did you read about the prisoners' habit patterns in practice sessions during those three to five to seven years of deprivation and boredom? What would you do if you were locked up with no end in sight? Would you sleep? Would you read? Would you do push-ups? Would you get depressed a lot? Would you feel sorry for yourself? Would you resent the folks back home? Or would you, as most of them did, make prison camp a self-improvement retreat? Several of our POWs made guitars out of wooden sticks and strings, and although their crude instruments made no sound at all, those who knew how to play practiced from memory, listening in their imaginations. They taught each other many new chords and finger positions and songs, and some POWs who had never held a guitar before are now accomplished flamenco guitarists. Seven years is a long time to practice. And other POWs at the Hanoi Hilton, they fashioned piano keyboards by taking a flat board and pencil sketching the key's actual size. Although their Steinways were silent and unplayable, they practiced day after day and enjoyed their favorite selections and others practiced typing on imaginary typewriters and came back at 40 words a minute without an error the first time they had ever typed on a real IBM typewriter. Physical fitness abounded in the prison camps. When there was nothing else to do, they did sit-ups. And one POW now holds the world's record, 4,500 sit-ups without resting. I'll never forget the story of Air Force Colonel George Hall, who played an imaginary round of golf every day during his five and a half years as a POW in North Vietnam. In his 8 by 8 cell, in black pajamas and bare feet, Colonel Hall played his best rounds of golf. You see, he'd been a four handicapper back home at the club, which many shot in the middle 70s. But in his mind, he played every shot, every club. He teed up every ball. He replaced every divot. He pulled out the flag on the green. He studied the break and putted down. Every game he'd ever played well in the past and every course he'd not yet played, but only seen on television.
This message is on the winning attitude of positive self-esteem, and self-esteem is the single most important quality of a winning human being. It's that deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. You know, I like myself. I really do like myself. Given my parents, my physical looks, and my limitations, and my lifestyle, and my background, I'm kind of glad I'm me. In fact, I'd rather be me than anyone else living at any other time in history. But I'm not conceited. In fact, conceit is God's gift to shallow people. This positive self-talk is the verbalization of inner value of a winner. And positive self-talk is the key to developing positive self-esteem. The winners in life have developed very strong beliefs of self-worth and self-confidence. They weren't necessarily born with these good feelings, but as with every other habit, they learn to like themselves through practice. Some individuals are born with much more going for them at the start. They have wealthy parents or beautiful parents or talented and intelligent parents. And many children in their early years have been encouraged and nurtured by winning parents and outstanding teachers and coaches and friends who gave them early feelings of self-esteem. And this is perhaps the most important quality of a good parent and also in a good business leader, the positive encouragement of their children and employees toward the development of self-worth. But there's an amazing historical pattern that is almost contradictory, and that's the pattern that some of the offspring of the richest, most beautiful, most talented people have become losers or lazy, unable to live up to their heritage, unable or not caring enough to accept themselves or perform effectively in society on their own. This may be because they had so much going for them at the start that they developed no inner drive to take them forward. And yet some of the offspring of the most backward, discouraging beginnings have grown into outstanding winners and top achievers in every walk of life. Out of adversity can come greatness. In the losers and low achievers in life, an attitude of low self-esteem seems to be at the root of their problem. Recent studies of terrorists, skyjackers, and assassins of world leaders have shown that these aggressors are very likely to be loners with extremely low self-esteem. And the same is true with most criminals. It's been said that John Dillinger, the notorious criminal, ran into a farmhouse and repeatedly told the occupants, My name is John Dillinger. My name is John Dillinger. I'm not going to hurt you. I just wanted you to know that my name is John Dillinger. A terrorist with no positive inner values and a fanatic disregard for others, driven by hate instead of love, feels he has to kill important leaders or innocent bystanders to make a media event and feel worthy of attention. What a terrible, pathetic tragedy. And thieves lacking in self-esteem steal others' belongings to make up for their own lack of values and inadequacies. And child abusers and wife beaters, they hide behind an angry mask of aggression to intimidate those vulnerable family members that gives them as bullies a false sense of power. But people like Golda Meir and Madame Curie and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Edison and Mother Teresa and Jonas Salk all have mentioned early feelings of worth and of their desire to pass their valuable service on to others. The studies of high-performance individuals verify again and again that positive self-esteem is the key ingredient. Studies of business managers and sales personnel attest to the same ingredient. Salespeople who doubt their own self-worth have only temporary success if they ever even get off the ground. And managers lacking in self-esteem seem to plateau very quickly or become paper shufflers. But the real top producers in business always seem to feel good about themselves because they realize that the measure of success in life is not so much based on the external conditions as it is with the deep-seated belief in one's own worth. Of all of our judgments through life, none is more important than the estimate we place on ourselves according to our own internal standards. To develop an even higher degree of positive self-esteem, winners learn to understand that self-development is a lifetime program. As we were growing up, many of us played an inferior role to the adults in our lives. We were told what to do and what not to do. We were constantly reminded of our shortcomings 
and we were told, don't always interrupt, and children should be seen and not heard. You're not old enough to do that. Here, let Dad show you how it's done. This bombardment can take its toll and can grow into the troubled teens and the generation gap if it's practiced continually. The low achievers in life seem to water and cultivate the early seeds of inferior feelings with their own imaginations, and they develop strong, prickly weeds which stick and irritate them for many years to come. You know, I've read about a native tribe in South America whose people have been dying prematurely of a strange malady for many generations. It was finally discovered that the disease was caused by the bite of an insect, which lives in the walls of their adobe homes. The natives have several possible solutions. They can destroy the insects with an insecticide. They can destroy and rebuild their homes. They can move to another area where there are no such insects. Or they can continue to live and die early, just as they have done for generations. And you know, they've chosen to remain as they are and die early. They've taken the path of no change and least resistance. And many people in life have a similar attitude about personal development. On the one hand, they know that learning brings about change, but on the other hand, they seem to resist change. They know that many people have overcome great obstacles to become great, but they can't imagine it happening to them. And so they resign themselves to be the also-rans in life, wishing and envying away their lives. These low achievers learn the habit of concentrating on their failures and all the negative events in their lives with self-talk that seems to reinforce this losing cycle. Because they're controlled by external standards that have been set by others, they often set their sights too high to begin with. And as they fail to reach their goals again and again, these failures become set in their subconscious self-images as actual targets and real goals of their own. This explains why so many well-meaning people have what I like to call permanent potential. In other words, they almost succeed over and over again, having only temporary or fleeting success, which fails to materialize into any solid lifestyle at all. It's also interesting to note that the blowhards in life, the ones who yell the loudest for service and try to get your attention, are really calling for help because of low self-esteem. What they're really shouting is, Help! Look at me, please. There's also a growing tendency today among many individuals to display an array of expensive possessions and outward trappings of affluence. This concentration on status symbols is more likely to say to others that the owner is actually lacking in self-esteem rather than the fact that he's rich. It's possible that only those with a strong sense of self-worth can afford to display a modest image to the community, and they usually do. But there's another side to modesty. Humility is serving others with value. Humiliation is when you tear yourself down in the process. Many people are prevented from using their talents because they live under the mistaken belief that it's wrong to be competitive, even as a means of testing their inner abilities and develop skills. They've become fanatic in their cry that it's wrong to be rich. They have the notion that it's noble to be poor and that poverty leads to spiritual purity. They rationalize from the scriptures that money is the root of all evil, not realizing that they're misquoting the timeless wisdom that the love of money is the root of all evil. When money, power over others, and personal gain are the major goals in life, then moral and economic crises are not far behind, not only for the individual, but for the entire society. You see, wealth is only a source of happiness when it's employed to do good for others. If you are developing a lifestyle that is pleasing and inspiring to yourself, and if your efforts are setting a healthy example for those who look to you for guidance and encouragement, then you are indeed a wealthy person. But lest you get the wrong impression, I see nothing wrong at all in being extremely financially successful. In fact, that's what free enterprise and the psychology of winning are all about. We should have the right to earn as much as we're willing to work and create for by providing products or services that benefit as many people as we can. And there's the key, that benefit others, not exploit them, not cater to their insecurities, to their sexual perversions or their obsessions, Financial resource is behind every scientific breakthrough, every medical technology, every industry, every book we read, and every job we have. 
Financial wealth is the harvest of our collective and individual productivity, and I believe in enjoying the fruits of my labors without guilt. Quality in everything is what we should invest in. It demands the highest price because it's made to function properly and to last a long time. To establish true self-esteem, we must concentrate on our own successes and forget about the failures and the negatives in our lives. The child's view must be recognized as just that, as serving a purpose in the early years, but dropping aside as we mature. Instead of comparing ourselves to others, we should compare ourselves with our own abilities, our own interests, and our own goals. And we can make a conscious effort to upgrade our lifestyle and pay more attention to personal appearance and personal habits. To develop more self-esteem, we need to base more of our actions and more of our decisions on rational thinking rather than on emotions. Emotions are the automatic product of subconscious integration, and they're passive and reactive in nature. To respond to the daily experiences and challenges of life by reacting emotionally is to nullify the wisdom and the power of the rational mind. The real winners are able to enjoy their emotions like children, probing the depths of love and excitement and joy and compassion. But the winners make the decisions that shape their lives through logic and common sense. And marriages today, of course, would be a lot stronger if they were entered into intelligently as well as emotionally. To develop and maintain high self-esteem, we need to find pleasure and pride in our current profession rather than looking at the greener pastures elsewhere. This is the philosophy of finding success in your own backyard, right now, right where you are, and making changes in your own internal standards rather than searching for external stimulation in a new environment. Although we're always seeking improvement, the real winners with positive self-esteem accept themselves just as they are at this moment. Since the perfect human being has not been discovered, we all need to live with our hang-ups and our idiosyncrasies until they can be ironed out. One of the most important qualities in successful dynamic living is that of self-acceptance, the willingness to be oneself and to live one's life as it's unfolding, accepting all the responsibility for the ultimate outcome. Perhaps the most important key to permanent enhancement of self-esteem is in the practice of positive self-talk. Every waking moment of our lives, we must feed our subconscious self-image positive affirmations about ourselves and our performances so relentlessly and so vividly that our self-images in time are modified to conform to the new higher standards. I've been conducting research on the power of words and images on the functions of the body, and I've been amazed at the tremendous influence that words and thoughts spoken at random can have on body functions that are monitored on biofeedback equipment. Since thoughts can raise and lower body temperature, secrete hormones, relax muscles and nerve endings, dilate and restrict arteries, and raise or lower pulse rate, it's obvious that we need to control the language we use on ourselves. That's why the winners in life rarely ever put themselves down in actions or in words. Losers fall into the trap of saying, I have to, I can't, I'm a klutz, I shoulda, woulda, coulda, mighta, oughta, if only Ida, if only Ida, I'll try, and I wish. And the most famous losing line of all, yeah, I know, but, or just, yeah, but. Winners use constructive self-talk every day. I want to, I can, I'm feeling better now, I'm improving, next time I'll get it right, I choose. I look forward to. I'll do it. One great indicator of our opinion of ourselves is the way we can accept a compliment. It's incredible how many of us tend to discount our worth and belittle ourselves when others try to pay us value. In my more unsuccessful early years, I had real trouble handling compliments. When I think back, it went something like this. Gee, Dennis, that's a good-looking suit. Is it new? My answer? No, I was going to give it to the goodwill. Gee, thank you very much, Dennis, for what you did for our son. And my response? Tell him it was nothing. You know, I'm sure they thought, gee, we thought it was special, till he said it was nothing. And I remember starting my speaking career, the hardest thing was to tell clients how much money I was worth. They used to ask me, 
how much do you charge to speak, Dennis? And I would hunch my shoulders and reply, how much can you afford? And they'd respond, well, we don't have a very big budget. And, of course, I'd then panic, sensing impending rejection, and I'd blurt out, oh, don't worry about your budget. I can fit into the smallest budget. And they would respond, too bad, Dennis. We wanted somebody better than that for our keynote speaker. They brought me an expensive present years ago for my birthday. And after opening it in front of the office staff and my boss, I remember saying with some embarrassment, Oh, you guys, you shouldn't have. You spent way too much on me. And I can just imagine my boss thinking to himself, I guess we did spend too much. Maybe I'll forget about his raise, too. He's probably not worth that much money and would be uncomfortable with a promotion of that size. You see, the problem with humorous humiliation and self-degrading remarks is that it not only tells others that you don't feel valuable, it tells your robot self-image, which is always recording, that these negative barbs are your real self-opinion, and they're stored as fact forever. People buy perceived value. You only sell you. The value of the seller is what influences the buyer. People's opinion of you is mostly based on your own implied and stated opinion of yourself. We talk ourselves into and out of every failure and every success. Positive self-esteem is the quality of simply saying thank you and accepting any value that is paid to you by others. Now let's review a few basic reminders that will keep your self-esteem up in the winning cycle. First, keep your self-talk affirmative in your business and at home. Because remember, your robot is recording every word. Second, accept all compliments with thank you. Third, dress and look your best at all times. Fourth, enjoy volunteering your own name first in initiating phone calls and in meeting new people. Fifth, develop the habit of sitting up front in seminars and meetings. Sixth, walk tall in a relaxed but faster pace. You know, winners really do because they know where they're going. Seventh, accept and enjoy yourself right now. Feel good when you indulge in some selfish activity that pleases just you. Eighth, set your own internal standards. Don't compare yourself to others. Ninth, keep a self-development plan ongoing at all times. Read, listen to cassettes, put down on paper the knowledge you'll require, the behavior modification you'll achieve, and the changes in your life which will result. And tenth and finally, remember the deep-down feeling of your own worth is the single most important winning quality. Not just pride in what you've done, but the real joy of being just who you are right now. This message is on the action quality of positive self-dimension. Positive self-dimension is self-esteem projected beyond yourself in everyday living. The greatest life in the world is living for yourself so you can give yourself away to others. And how can you give away what you don't feel for yourself? Well, you can't. Unless you love yourself, you can't respect and love others either. Oh, you can need them or you can use them, but there can be no mutual respect without your active practice of positive self-dimension. The healthy high achievers function effectively because they maintain a healthy dialogue between themselves and others, treating others with the same respect, integrity, and care as they accord themselves. And so the real winners in life have positive self-dimension. They look beyond themselves for meaning in life. Winners can put it all together as a total person. What a rare human being! a whole total person. Winners have the ability to step back from the canvas of their lives like an artist gaining perspective, and they make their lives a work of art, an individual masterpiece, but a masterpiece that illustrates the big picture. Self-dimension takes the psychology of winning 
off the shelf, and out into the universe. The greatest example of self-dimension a winner can display is that quality of earning the love and respect of other human beings. The real psychology of winning in life does not mean cutting the legs off or standing victoriously over a fallen enemy, because winning self-dimension is extending a strong hand to one that is reaching or groping or just trying to hang on. The winners know that there will be no lasting peace on earth until there is a piece of bread in every mouth. Winners create other winners without exploiting them. They plant shade trees under which they know they'll never sit. They know that true winning in life for the human race is when caring and sharing people help even one other individual to live a better life. Self-dimension begins with the inner circle, the family. Is your family a winning team, or is it a chicken outfit that the kids can hardly wait to get out of? Are your personal relationships precious to you, or have you lost touch, except for holidays, anniversaries, reunions, and parties? I know a community leader who was busy speaking at evening meetings while his kids were stealing car stereos. You see, winners get it together with their loved ones, with their friends, and with the community in which they live. They also love their careers, but they're not married to them. Winners vote, and they care about the management and its effectiveness and its fairness and its honesty in their cities and in their states and in the nation as well. Winners live a well-rounded life. They build their spheres of relationships with evenly distributed emphasis. Are you a financial success with plenty of money to spend but no time for your kids? Losers try to buy love and trust, and they fail every time. Do you spend all your time with your family, but not enough time earning enough to care for them? Do you have a winning scout troop as an outside activity, but a losing, neglected family at home? Are you pretty or macho externally, and shallow and egotistical internally? Does your sphere of life have all the pressure at one point? If it does, it could burst. The losers in life have the philosophy of do it to others before they do it to you. They have the I win and you lose attitude. And one of the most infamous self-made men who nearly ruled the world by using self-image and self-direction to achieve his goals became the greatest loser in history. He was Adolf Hitler. When he was a young billboard paper hanger, he convinced a few loyal followers that he was destined to become the Fuhrer of the Third Reich. He won every battle at the expense of other human beings, and he lost the whole ball game in the end, becoming one of the greatest human tragedies in modern history. Adolf Hitler was a pathetic example of low self-esteem transformed into a grossly distorted self-dimension of do it to others before they do it to you. The real winners in life practice the double win attitude. If I help you win, then I win too. I win, and you win. And they realize that it's not nice to fool Mother Nature either, because nature is innocent and abundant, but very unforgiving. We've exploited her resources, and she's responding like a mirror, reflecting our gluttony and plunder with dwindling resources, pollution, unclean air, unsafe water, toxic food, and cancerous byproducts of technology. As we change our environment to suit our short-range ambitions, we may be risking the very survival of the human race. And therefore, real positive self-dimension is an understanding of the vulnerability of the life process and the delicate balance of ecology. The winners remember that those who owned the earth for thousands of years may be in the hall of fame of the extinct. They know that New York could become Tyrannosaurus Rex and Los Angeles the woolly mammoth or mastodon unless they cherish the natural environment and put back at least as much as they take out of the earth. And winners take their cues from their friends, the animals, as well. They know what sealskin coats and fancy furs of ocelot can mean to future generations. Someday, when sea world's long gone dry, and all the birds have flown, and all the fish are gone, or on your dinner table, and all the animals are rubberized, or polyester foam, available exclusively on stage at Disney World, someday a group of wise men will deduce and calculate that what befell the animals could well be human fate. Someday, if we're not careful, we may find in some museum a glass display that lights up when you press the rail, complete with tape-recorded spiel that tells in 30 seconds 
of the day when man and woman roamed the planet Earth with their beloved friends, the animals, self-dimension, fitting in, drawing upon the spiritual power woven intricately into every fiber of our being. Winners in life go beyond the horoscopes and stars and fortune tellers' prophecies. They go beyond the do-it-to-yourself advice, even beyond their plastic surgeon's knife, and they live each precious golden day as if it were their last. They build for the future, and they learn from the past. Positive self-dimension is being in harmony with the divine order that shapes the entire universe. It is seen in the perfection and in the beauty manifested in nature, and recognizes the imperfection of man's attempt to reshape nature in his own image. Winners are able to put their own lives into perspective with other human beings, learning from past generations, and open to the idea that other forms of life, possibly more advanced, may be present in the outer reaches of this galaxy or other galaxies beyond. Winners with their positive self-dimension, most importantly, have a keen awareness of the value of time, which once spent, is gone from their lives forever. Winners seem to understand the concept which I call close encounters of the fourth kind. Close encounters of the fourth kind have nothing to do with UFOs or Star Wars. The fourth dimension is time, and time is forever the ultimate ruler in each of our own lives. When we were children, time stood still. It took forever for Christmas and summer vacation to arrive, our 21st birthday was always way out in the future, and then it came and went. A close encounter of the fourth kind is a life experience in which you come face to face with the reality that there are no timeouts, no substitutions, no replays, that it's not a rehearsal or a practice game, but it's truly the Super Bowl, World Cup, or big game every day. And this is not merely a cliché with the winner. It's a sobering understanding that the clock never stops. Your encounter may be a near miss on the freeway, it could be the loss of a close friend or a serious illness in the family, or something as simple as a high school or college reunion, or an encounter with an old family photo album, or even a new look at yourself in your own bathroom mirror. I went to my 30th high school reunion not too long ago, and it was a sobering experience. If you haven't been to your own 20th or 30th high school reunion, don't go. They're close encounters of the worst kind. You'll see old people who claim to be your classmates. The cheerleaders look like the refrigerettes. The most likely to succeed didn't. The curly-headed guy in my English class is as bald as marvelous Marvin Hagler or Telly Savalas. The shy girl in my speech class is a trial attorney. The guy who was afraid of heights is an astronaut. It just doesn't compute anymore. All my old friends had to look at my name tag with their reading glasses on, and they still couldn't put the name with the face. I told them all, I travel a lot and get jet advance instead of jet lag. Winners learn from each of these close encounters. This message is on the action quality of positive self-projection. The winning attitude of positive self-awareness is transformed into action through positive self-projection. You know, winners in life are walking, talking examples of positive self-projection. You can always spot a winner when he or she first enters a room. Winners project a kind of aura about them. They have an unmistakable presence. They have a charisma which is disarming and radiating and magnetic. They project that warm glow that comes from inside out. Most importantly, the winners are naturally open and friendly. They know that a smile is the universal language that opens doors and melts defenses and saves a thousand words. A smile is the light in your window that tells others there's a caring, sharing person inside. And winners are aware that first impressions are powerful and create lasting attitudes, and that the old saying, you never get a second chance for a first impression, is true. They understand that interpersonal relationships can be won or lost in about the first four minutes of conversation. Winners have learned through experience that fairly or unfairly, people project and respond to a visceral or gut-level feeling which is nearly instantaneous. Many careers and top jobs in sales and other important transactions are decided very early in the interview or negotiation. 
Winners know that everyone projects and receives through a different encoding and decoding system, as if each of us had his own satellite receiver, with no one else tuned in on his exact channel or wavelength. Therefore, the winners in life realize that the best they can hope for in the communication process with others is for a common level of understanding, profitable to the other person or the rest of the group. That's the best they can hope for. There are some fundamental consistent patterns that winning human beings follow in this practice of positive self-projection. First, winners always look like winners at their best. They know the clock is always running, that the bird of time is on the wing, and they feel that since there's no time to lose, why not put their best foot forward? Winners respect the fact that we as people usually project on the outside how we really feel about ourselves on the inside. For example, when we aren't feeling well physically, we don't seem to look as well at the skin or surface level either. And correspondingly, when we don't feel good about ourselves emotionally or mentally, we don't seem to make a very good impression with our looks, our personal grooming, or clothing habits. Studies have shown the definite correlation between looking good and success in life. A recent Harvard study pointed out that people who feel unattractive as judged by themselves and their peers tend to suffer from feelings of loneliness and rejection and isolation. And school children who look good are actually treated better not only by their classmates but by their teachers as well. The term good-looking as we're using it here doesn't necessarily mean beautiful or handsome like a movie star because other studies have shown that some of the most beautiful young people physically are less satisfied, less well-adjusted, and less happy in later life. But what can we learn from these insights? First, while we have no choice over the genes that we've inherited and thus are stuck with our general shape and our structure and our skin, it's to our advantage to take care of our health and appearance and to do what we can to enhance what we've got, because like it or not, we'll be judged by our looks with an instant and lasting impression. And second, since we behave according to the way we think we look rather than the way we actually look to others, those of us who can learn to be fairly satisfied with our features are way ahead of the game as far as being real winners in the game of life. In today's cosmetic, chemical, and plastic society, there's a real need for internal value when we consider the true meaning of positive self-projection. We seem to be taking a good thing, which is doing the best with what we've got, and going overboard with self-indulgence in an attempt to buy the fountain of youth or superficial happiness. We know, of course, that the kind of house, car, clothing, and possessions that we show off to the world is our attempt to tell others who we are. But more important than telling others who we are is that our expressed standards of living serve to remind us ourselves who we are. But in today's world of easy credit, in what some have called the plastic age because of the flood of credit cards and the ease with which they can be obtained and used, anyone can arrange to display a sports car or a powerboat or a motorhome in front of his or her home. But the true winners project success without flaunting it. The winners may not always be able to afford to buy the very best and most expensive of everything, but they always do the very best with what they've got and with what they can afford, knowing that the world is looking. So we don't have to be rich or spend a fortune to project the look of a winner. All it takes is a little extra effort and time in personal grooming. A good appearance is the way to stop people who are important to us and gain their attention long enough to project our inside value, kind of like a good book among the thousands available on the bookshelf. Another important point in winning self-projection is the way in which we introduce ourselves to others. It sounds so basic, almost silly. Winners in nearly every first encounter, whether in person or by telephone, lead by giving their own name first. Hello, my name is Dennis Waitley. As simple as it may seem, by stating our own name up front in a positive, affirmative manner, we're projecting self-worth and giving others immediate reason to accept us as someone important to remember. Winners get in touch by extending their hand first, knowing it's a time-proven way of paying value and respect to others. And along with the warm handshake, winners use direct eye contact 
and a warm open smile to project interest in communication. Nothing marks the loser so clearly as shifty wandering eyes, unable to look straight into our own, but looking down in a way as if to say, I can't be straightforward with you because it's too uncomfortable. And nothing marks a winner so clearly as a relaxed smile and a face that volunteers his or her own name and enjoys it while extending his or her hand to yours and looking directly into your eyes. Winners learn the art of projecting themselves through active listening. Once they introduce themselves, they become the listeners. They know that listeners learn a great deal, while talkers learn nothing. That's why we have two eyes, two ears, and only one mouth, so we can observe and listen more than we talk. And winners ask questions when they do speak. They draw the other person out. They ask for examples. They ask for feedback. They ask others to put it in other words, and they feedback what others have said for clarity and understanding. Winners know that paying value to others is the greatest communication skill of all. Earl Nightingale, one of the greatest self-development philosophers of our time, calls this unique skill the I'll make them glad they talk with me attitude. This is a great idea that's so simple it's almost deceptive. We have to examine it carefully to understand how it works and why. I'll make them glad they talk with me is an attitude that can become a whole way of life when winners face a prospect or an adversary or a potential friend. When they pick up a telephone, their attitude is service-oriented and not self-oriented. Their concern is for the other person and not themselves. When we have someone else's interest at heart, not just our own, the other person can sense it. They may not be able to put it into words just why they feel that way, but they do. On the other hand, people get an uneasy feeling when they talk with a person who has only his or her own interest in mind and not theirs. There's an excellent reason why we get these feelings about people. It's known as nonverbal communication. It's the old business of who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. And it's tremendously important to all of us in self-projection. We communicate by means of some 700,000 nonverbal signals. Now, when we consider the limited vocabulary of the average person, it's easy to understand why nonverbal communication has more effect than most of us had ever realized. People, whether they know it or not, telegraph their intentions and feelings. Whatever goes on on the inside seems to show on the outside. We receive most of these nonverbal communications below the conscious level of thinking. Our subconscious robot-like minds evaluate them and then serve them up to us as feelings based on our past experience. When we adopt the I'll make them glad they talk with me attitude, this idea of helping the other people solve their problem, we have their interest at heart. Then the feelings they receive agree with what they hear us say, and the climate is just right for all of us to benefit. Everybody wins with this attitude. So winners listen to the whole person. They observe body language, realizing that folded or crossed arms sometimes means a defensive or introverted listener. They understand that hands on the hips or active gesturing can mean an aggressive attitude. And winners watch the eyes, which can look down or away in self-consciousness or guilt, or which can flare or pinpoint in surprise or anger. Winners listen to the extraverbal messages too, the tone of voice, the tremor, the nervous laugh. The winners in business and personal relationships and in marriage take 100% of the responsibility for success in the communication process. In other words, winners never meet you halfway or go 50-50. As listeners, winners take 100% of the responsibility for hearing what you mean, and as talkers, winners take 100% of the responsibility for being certain that you understand what they're saying. By giving examples, by asking you for feedback, by putting what they say in different words, they can make it easy for you to gain the true intent of their communication. And winners use the KISS formula. KISS in communications means keep it straightforward and simple. Winners project in clear, concise, simple language, and they use words and examples that don't evoke a double meaning or a hidden agenda. And last and most importantly, Winners in life project constructive, supportive ideas. They're neither cynical nor critical. Winners accept another viewpoint as being valid 
even if it is diametrically opposed to their own beliefs. A winner says, You know, I appreciate and understand your position. However, I may feel differently, and if so, I'd like to tell you why my position may be different from your own. When Will Rogers said, You know, I never met a man I didn't like, I'm sure he didn't mean that he approved of all the traits and characteristics of every man he met, but he always found something he could admire in everyone, because he knew that we get back from people what we give them. If we want to be loved, we must first be lovable in our self-projection. Think back to the people who've had the most influence on you. You'll likely find that they were people who really cared about you, your parents, or a good teacher, a business associate, a good friend, someone who really was interested in you. And the only people you'll influence to any great degree in your life will be the people you care about. When you're with people you care about, their interest and not yours will be the uppermost thing in your mind, and this is most evident in marriage and parenthood, but it's also true in every other area of our lives. It's been said that marriage is not looking at each other, but looking in the same direction together. And this is just as relevant in other areas of our lives as it is in marriage. It's not looking at each other, but looking in the same direction together that counts. Our success in getting along with others and in communicating effectively with them depends upon this same principle. It depends solely upon our ability to help other people solve their problems. This is winning self-projection. The winners say, I'll make you glad you talk with me. And to a winner, you'll say, you know, I like me best when I'm with you. The true psychology of winning is gained in projecting the ten qualities of the total winner. Number one, project an attitude of positive self-expectancy. Be optimistic and enthusiastic about yourself. Remember the basis for psychosomatic health, that life is a self-fulfilling prophecy and that the body manifests what the mind harbors. Look at problems as opportunities. Since you usually get what you expect in life, expect the best for you. Number two, project that action quality of positive self-motivation. Remember that since you become what you think about most, that you're moving constantly in the direction of your currently dominant thoughts. Remember that lasting change is based upon a burning desire that has been internalized by you into an inner commitment. Since fear and desire are the two most powerful motivators in our everyday lives, go for the rewards of success and don't try to go away from the penalties of failure. You become permanently slim, not by trying to think of losing weight, but by thinking thin and moving toward your desired weight. In business, project what you want. Don't point out what you don't want to happen. Number three, project the winning attitude of a positive self-image. Realize once and for all that your imagined self is either your life's achieving mechanism or your self-limiting handicap. Your self-image is like a thermostat or a robot autopilot. Change the setting of the image and your behavior or performance will automatically seek the level you've set. Your self-image can't distinguish right from wrong or truth from fantasy. So see the image of that person you'd most like to become and remember that imagination really does rule your world. Number four, project your self-image into specific goals with an action plan of positive self-direction. Consider the real power of purpose. Set lifetime goals, as soon as possible goals, time priority goals, and concentrate on your most important daily goals. Write them down. No distraction. Check them off. Set them incrementally, just out of reach, but not out of sight. Number five, project the winning attitude of positive self-control. Winners make it happen, while losers let it happen. Take full responsibility for causing your own good effects. Make the decisions, and exercise the choices that are open to you. And six, Project your self-control in the action quality of positive self-discipline. Remember that habits start like cobwebs, as flimsy notions at first, and then with practice become like unbreakable cables to shackle or strengthen our lives. 
Practice winning every single day. Simulate the correct information to win with relentless inner visualization over and over again. Practice within when you're doing without. And seven, project that attitude of positive self-esteem as your single most important human quality. Get that deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. Use positive self-talk every day. Learn to accept every compliment with a simple thank you and accept yourself as a changing, growing, deserving human being. Eight, project yourself beyond yourself with positive self-dimension. Get the spirit of the double win. Create other winners, too. Love yourself so you can give yourself away and plant some shade trees under which you know you'll never sit. Learn the precious value of time. Profit from the past. Set meaningful goals in the near future. But live in the now, staying away from someday aisle. And do it now, the only moment over which you have any control. Nine, project your understanding of true self-awareness in life. Tune in on all the abundance in your arenas. Recognize your unlimited potential. Be honest with yourself and with others, too. And walk in another Indian's moccasins for a mile before you pass judgment on him or her. And ten and finally... Project yourself with winning communication to others. Take 100% of the responsibility for sending and receiving. Listen to the whole person. Make others say, you know, I'm glad I talk with you, and I like me best when I'm with you. So look your best at all times, and project your best self at all times. Become a total winner by putting yourself together as a total person. Remember, this is not a scrimmage. It's not a drill. There's no replay, because the psychology of winning is a way of life. It's playing the game to win, and it's got to be your Olympic competition every single day. This message is on the action quality of positive self-projection. The winning attitude of positive self-awareness is transformed into action through positive self-projection. You know, winners in life are walking, talking examples of positive self-projection. You can always spot a winner when he or she first enters a room. Winners project a kind of aura about them. They have an unmistakable presence. They have a charisma which is disarming and radiating and magnetic. They project that warm glow that comes from inside out. Most importantly, the winners are naturally open and friendly. They know that a smile is the universal language that opens doors and melts defenses and saves a thousand words. A smile is the light in your window that tells others there's a caring, sharing person inside. And winners are aware that first impressions are powerful and create lasting attitudes, and that the old saying, you never get a second chance for a first impression, is true. They understand that interpersonal relationships can be won or lost in about the first four minutes of conversation. Winners have learned through experience that fairly or unfairly, people project and respond to a visceral or gut-level feeling which is nearly instantaneous. Many careers and top jobs in sales and other important transactions are decided very early in the interview or negotiation. Winners know that everyone projects and receives through a different encoding and decoding system, as if each of us had his own satellite receiver, with no one else tuned in on his exact channel or wavelength. Therefore, the winners in life realize that the best they can hope for in the communication process with others is for a common level of understanding profitable to the other person or the rest of the group. That's the best they can hope for. There are some fundamental consistent patterns that winning human beings follow in this practice of positive self-projection. First, winners always look like winners at their best. They know the clock is always running, that the bird of time is on the wing, and they feel that since there's no time to lose, why not put their best foot forward? Winners respect the fact that we as people usually project on the outside 
how we really feel about ourselves on the inside. For example, when we aren't feeling well physically, we don't seem to look as well at the skin or surface level either. And correspondingly, when we don't feel good about ourselves emotionally or mentally, we don't seem to make a very good impression with our looks, our personal grooming, or clothing habits. Studies have shown the definite correlation between looking good and success in life. A recent Harvard study pointed out that people who feel unattractive as judged by themselves and their peers tend to suffer from feelings of loneliness and rejection and isolation. And school children who look good are actually treated better not only by their classmates but by their teachers as well. The term good-looking as we're using it here doesn't necessarily mean beautiful or handsome like a movie star because other studies have shown that some of the most beautiful young people physically are less satisfied, less well-adjusted, and less happy in later life. But what can we learn from these insights? First, while we have no choice over the genes that we've inherited and thus are stuck with our general shape and our structure and our skin, it's to our advantage to take care of our health and appearance and to do what we can to enhance what we've got, because like it or not, we'll be judged by our looks with an instant and lasting impression. And second, since we behave according to the way we think we look rather than the way we actually look to others, those of us who can learn to be fairly satisfied with our features are way ahead of the game as far as being real winners in the game of life. In today's cosmetic, chemical, and plastic society, there's a real need for internal value when we consider the true meaning of positive self-projection. We seem to be taking a good thing which is doing the best with what we've got and going overboard with self-indulgence in an attempt to buy the fountain of youth or superficial happiness. We know, of course, that the kind of house, car, clothing, and possessions that we show off to the world is our attempt to tell others who we are. But more important than telling others who we are is that our expressed standards of living serve to remind us ourselves who we are. But in today's world of easy credit, in what some have called the plastic age because of the flood of credit cards and the ease with which they can be obtained and used, anyone can arrange to display a sports car or a powerboat or a motorhome in front of his or her home. But the true winners project success without flaunting it. The winners may not always be able to afford to buy the very best and most expensive of everything, but they always do the very best with what they've got and with what they can afford knowing that the world is looking. So we don't have to be rich or spend a fortune to project the look of a winner. All it takes is a little extra effort and time in personal grooming. A good appearance is the way to stop people who are important to us and gain their attention long enough to project our inside value, kind of like a good book among the thousands available on the bookshelf. Another important point in winning self-projection is the way in which we introduce ourselves to others. It sounds so basic, almost silly. Winners in nearly every first encounter, whether in person or by telephone, lead by giving their own name first. Hello, my name is Dennis Waitley. As simple as it may seem, by stating our own name up front in a positive, affirmative manner, we're projecting self-worth and giving others immediate reason to accept us as someone important to remember. Winners get in touch by extending their hand first, knowing it's a time-proven way of paying value and respect to others. And along with the warm handshake, winners use direct eye contact and a warm open smile to project interest in communication. Nothing marks the loser so clearly as shifty wandering eyes, unable to look straight into our own but looking down in a way as if to say, I can't be straightforward with you because it's too uncomfortable. And nothing marks a winner so clearly as a relaxed smile and a face that volunteers his or her own name and enjoys it while extending his or her hand to yours and looking directly into your eyes. Winners learn the art of projecting themselves through active listening. Once they introduce themselves, they become the listeners. They know that listeners learn a great deal, while talkers learn nothing. That's why we have two eyes, two ears, and only one mouth, so we can observe and listen more than we talk. And winners ask questions when they do speak. They draw the other person out, 
They ask for examples. They ask for feedback. They ask others to put it in other words, and they feedback what others have said for clarity and understanding. Winners know that paying value to others is the greatest communication skill of all. Earl Nightingale, one of the greatest self-development philosophers of our time, calls this unique skill the I'll make them glad they talk with me attitude. This is a great idea that's so simple it's almost deceptive. We have to examine it carefully to understand how it works and why. I'll make them glad they talk with me is an attitude that can become a whole way of life when winners face a prospect or an adversary or a potential friend. When they pick up a telephone, their attitude is service-oriented and not self-oriented. Their concern is for the other person and not themselves. When we have someone else's interest at heart, not just our own, the other person can sense it. They may not be able to put it into words just why they feel that way, but they do. On the other hand, people get an uneasy feeling when they talk with a person who has only his or her own interest in mind and not theirs. There's an excellent reason why we get these feelings about people. It's known as nonverbal communication. It's the old business of who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. And it's tremendously important to all of us in self-projection. We communicate by means of some 700,000 nonverbal signals. Now, when we consider the limited vocabulary of the average person, it's easy to understand why nonverbal communication has more effect than most of us had ever realized. People, whether they know it or not, telegraph their intentions and feelings. Whatever goes on on the inside seems to show on the outside. We receive most of these nonverbal communications below the conscious level of thinking. Our subconscious robot-like minds evaluate them and then serve them up to us as feelings based on our past experience. When we adopt the I'll make them glad they talk with me attitude, this idea of helping the other people solve their problem, we have their interest at heart. Then the feelings they receive agree with what they hear us say, and the climate is just right for all of us to benefit. Everybody wins with this attitude. So winners listen to the whole person. They observe body language, realizing that folded or crossed arms sometimes means a defensive or introverted listener. They understand that hands on the hips or active gesturing can mean an aggressive attitude. And winners watch the eyes, which can look down or away in self-consciousness or guilt, or which can flare or pinpoint in surprise or anger. Winners listen to the extraverbal messages too, the tone of voice, the tremor, the nervous laugh. The winners in business and personal relationships and in marriage take 100% of the responsibility for success in the communication process. In other words, winners never meet you halfway or go 50-50. As listeners, winners take 100% of the responsibility for hearing what you mean, and as talkers, winners take 100% of the responsibility for being certain that you understand what they're saying. By giving examples, by asking you for feedback, by putting what they say in different words, they can make it easy for you to gain the true intent of their communication. And winners use the KISS formula. KISS in communications means keep it straightforward and simple. Winners project in clear, concise, simple language, and they use words and examples that don't evoke a double meaning or a hidden agenda. And last and most importantly, Winners in life project constructive, supportive ideas. They're neither cynical nor critical. Winners accept another viewpoint as being valid, even if it is diametrically opposed to their own beliefs. A winner says, You know, I appreciate and understand your position. However, I may feel differently, and if so, I'd like to tell you why my position may be different from your own. When Will Rogers said, You know, I never met a man I didn't like, I'm sure he didn't mean that he approved of all the traits and characteristics of every man he met, but he always found something he could admire in everyone, because he knew that we get back from people what we give them. If we want to be loved, we must first be lovable in our self-projection. Think back to the people who've had the most influence on you. You'll likely find that they were people who really cared about you, your parents, or a good teacher, a business associate, a good friend, someone who really was interested in you. And the only people you'll influence to any great degree in your life 
will be the people you care about. When you're with people you care about, their interests and not yours. As we enter the final few staging years that will launch us into the 21st century, I've never been more excited about our opportunities for winning the game of life. Winning in the 21st century will feature champions of cooperation rather than champions of competition. It's painfully true that strong national strength and defense considerations will continue, and these to prevent intimidation by dictatorships and terrorists, to assure access to world communication and transportation routes, and vital strategic resources. However, the survival of the fittest philosophy will give way to the survival of the wisest philosophy, and that's one of understanding and reason and mutual benefit agreements among all the nations of the world. Why then my unbounding optimism in the face of all this international and domestic turmoil? Well, the answer is simple. We must help each other win right now. Our very survival as a society depends upon it. There's no other option. There are too many people who affect each other's lives. Too few resources, too many births, too little time, and too delicate a balance between technology and nature to ever produce winners in isolation today. We as individuals are a vital but single organ of a larger body of human beings in the world. It's as if we all feed off the same main artery for our life's blood supply, and indeed we do. At a time when lifespans in our more advanced nations are fast approaching 80 years, millions of individuals in underdeveloped nations never reach puberty because of starvation and disease. And just when we thought we could bank on early retirement with plenty of leisure pursuits as a result of our super high standard of living, along came the Asian nations, hungry, willing, and able to produce higher quality products at lower costs for lower pay. Thus, they knocked our competitive socks off and forced us to buy more imported goods than we could sell as exports. The huge balance of trade deficit is the harvest. And this means that we in the West will have to work longer, harder, smarter, better, and for less money. While at the same time, we're wistfully watching lifestyles of the rich and famous on television. To put the problem and the opportunity in clear perspective, interdependence, has replaced independence. You see, we can't win or even survive very long anymore unless we cooperate with one another. And there are three basic reasons for this. You've got to fully understand them and pass them along to your family members and to your business associates. First, there's a widening gap between the technological advanced nations and those that cannot and will never be able to keep pace. This means that more and more people will have to be helped aboard a wagon pulled into the future by fewer and fewer high achievers. Second, there are rising expectations among developing nations, especially in the Asian countries. These expectations provide these nations the motivation and the incentives to outproduce us and gain a significantly bigger share of the standard of living pie. And third, we live in a shrinking fishbowl of a world in the sense that instant satellite communications and supersonic and soon hypersonic travel will bring all the major cities of the world within a three-hour commuting range. This will place the have-not peoples and the have-peoples together, rubbing elbows on a daily basis. The economic and lifestyle imbalances will become even more visible, and the risk of terrorist-provoked nuclear blackmail will be greatly increased. The answer, of course is winning teamwork, and it will work. The stage is set. If we help the underdeveloped nations and ourselves win, then we all win. We either win together or we lose together. Many intellectuals believe the idea of peaceful cooperation throughout the world to be a Pollyanna vision seen through rose-colored glasses. They're the cynics who believe that history always repeats itself because so far it always has. As we prepare to enter the 21st century, they remind us that the human track record is pretty grim. You see, no society has ever survived its own success. Whenever they do get on top for a period of time, they forget how they got there, and they rest on their laurels, playing king and queen of the mountain, and apathy, greed, laziness, and self-indulgence set in. 
and they fall on their rears. As each society has thrived in the past, creativity, interdependence, and mutual support have provided the synergy where the whole has been greater and better than the sum of all of the parts. At the peak period of success, takers were in the distinct minority because people were committed to the necessity to be givers, in other words, lovers of the group. But as each society flourished, China, Persia, Greece, Rome, Inca, Maya, France, Britain, and now America, more and more people become materially well off. And what's gone wrong is the failure of many people to stay committed to loving and caring about others and to continue to give to the total group so that all might survive. When survival is no longer an issue, it's very tempting to indulge in selfish, hedonistic pleasures. As more and more people succumb to this temptation, there are fewer and fewer givers or contributors to society, and more takers or freeloaders. The result, which has repeated itself throughout human history, is a shift from a team effort to a struggle between the takers and the givers. Takers, of course, are those who live strictly for the pursuit of their own immediate pleasure, regardless of the side effects on future generations. But givers, on the other hand, enjoy pursuing goals that benefit themselves, their children, and everyone else's children as well. As each society in the past has reached material success, the takers have gorged themselves and the givers have been stuck with the check. This has continued until a society falls apart in moral and material bankruptcy, when the bill becomes unpayable as the takers become the majority. But there's a ray of light among the thunderclouds as we approach the 21st century, and it could be as powerful and piercing as a big laser beam. We are actually learning from history, and we're beginning to move back to team play in the game of life. There's a growing awareness that the me-first generation is dead wrong and dead wood. Although alcohol, cocaine, and designer drugs are being consumed at alarming rates, there's a rising groundswell crying out that enough is enough and that collective suicide is totally unacceptable. The giver's response to the taker's indulgence is in the fitness movement and new health consciousness, self-development programs, bicycles, treadmills, aerobics, nutrition awareness, walking, jogging, more outdoor activities, more team sports, quality circles, value-added management programs, shared responsibility, employee stock option programs, more community involvement programs, an all-out war on drug abuse, and more real concern for the hungry and needy masses. The economic success of Japan and its Asian neighbors has been a blessing in disguise. It's given our own corporate and government leaders a humbling awakening and a harsh lesson in productivity. The ability of the Asians to suppress their individual egos and feelings of entitlement, making them open to receive others' ideas and know-how, is one of their most important assets. Oversimplified, it's respect for the wisdom of parents and elders, and it fosters innovation by combining history and tradition with technological inventions so that balance and perspective can be maintained between generations. It combines lessons of the past with futurism, and it's diametrically opposed to the if-it-feels-good-do-it and when in Rome do as the Romans do mentality. And it's foreign to the famous yuppie t-shirt slogan, He who dies with most toys wins. The truth is, he or she who lives with most joys wins. Armed with this new and increasing awareness, you and I can win the game of life in the 21st century. And at the same time, we can prepare the playing field for future generations. So this cassette is for you to listen to, absorb, and re-listen to. It's for you to share with those individuals you really care about. I believe the winning keys that follow will unlock your door to success now and in the next century and give you the winner's edge in your personal and professional life. I also believe the concepts will be just as relevant in the year 2020 as they are today. Here are 10 winning keys to the 21st century. Winning key number one, adapt to the three C's. And what are the three C's? They are change, complexity, and competition. 
As we approach the 21st century, you can be certain that these three C's will dominate your world. Accelerating change, rising complexity, and increasing competition. So don't wait until change occurs and then react. Stay ahead of the change by keeping more informed. This means more reading, more educational television, and less recreational television. It means more seminars, more networking with data resources, and more university courses. It means expanding your circle of friends and associates to include more who are in the cutting-edge high-tech companies and in international or multinational firms, especially those doing business in Asia. To handle increasing complexity, you need to become user-friendly with your computer, even if it means hiring an expert to break down your barriers. But most of all, you need to be time priority conscious. Focus on your most important goals and delegate or eliminate low productivity activities. Winning competitors in the 21st century won't be obsessed with beating out the other person and stepping on others' heads to get to the top. Their motivation will be to do such a good job at their assigned task that they will always be regarded as among the top in a fast field of excellent talent. In the long run, the right approach to competition is that everyone is better off just for having run his or her best race. Real competition comes from those who love to give the customer the highest quality service at a reasonable price and attract repeat business. Winning key number two. The winner's secret is enjoying the game. If you enjoy your work, you'll do it better. You see, joy cannot be found outside yourself, nor should it be confused with happy hour escapism. Never work solely for the money. Also, don't equate your position or your status with your personal barometer for happiness or success. In other words, work and worth are not really the same. No matter what you do for a living, you're as worthy of experiencing success as anyone else. Identify your abilities and skills. Do a feasibility study. Of all your talents, which have the most promise for future development? What do you really enjoy doing most? Try to incorporate what you really like to do into your career. And also try using more of your hobby skills in your daily profession. Make all of your life a hobby that you pursue with the eagerness and enthusiasm that you bring to an exciting outing on Saturday. Winning key number three, tune out the bad news. A study recently completed by George Washington University monitored the national evening television news for 100 nights. Over 6,500 negative statements were recorded, while only 370 positive or good news items were logged. It's obvious that we're grossly overinformed about catastrophes we can do little or nothing about, and there's no question that bad news sells ratings. The majority of the general public exists on a mental diet of television, motion pictures created to shock us, and slick publications designed to stimulate us. I consider most of what we have available as junk food that leads to mental malnutrition and poor emotional and spiritual health. Television constantly exposes children and adults to antisocial behavior performed by the incompetent, the uncouth, and the insane. At the other extreme are the superheroes with unnatural strength and superhuman abilities. They're handsome and beautiful. And when average individuals compare themselves to their TV heroes, they usually see themselves as inadequate. Recent studies conducted by a Stanford University research team have revealed that what we listen to and what we watch does have a marked effect on our imaginations, our learning patterns, and our behaviors. First, we're exposed to new behaviors and characters. Next, we learn or acquire these new behaviors. And the last and most crucial step is that we adopt these behaviors as our own. One of the most critical aspects of human development that we need to understand is the influence of repeated viewing and repeated listening and verbalizing in shaping our lifestyles. 
The information goes in harmlessly, almost unnoticed, on a daily basis. But we don't react to it until later, when we aren't able to realize the basis for our reactions. In other words, our value system is being formed without any conscious awareness on our part of what is really happening. If you really want to win in the 21st century and raise a winning family in the process, demand more educational and more positive television programming. Demand higher quality motion pictures by passing up the marginal ones. If you have to, boycott the theaters by renting good video cassettes. Save your money and your kids' money by being more selective. Winning key number four, become a lifelong learner. You know, school is never out for the winner. Continuing education in today's world is the rule rather than the exception. But many people still believe that life is lived in three distinctly separate phases. Phase one, you go to school until you graduate with a certain amount of knowledge. This should take about 12 to 16 years, they figure. Phase two, you go to work and use your school knowledge to advance as fast as you can. And you earn as much as you can and get some kind of financial nest egg built up. Phase three, you finally reach your real goal. You retire and go to pasture trying desperately to make up for all the years you wasted in school and at work. This prevalent limiting attitude has been called the three boxes of life. And you and I are not going to fall into them. If you're in the early stages of your career, consider these facts. Because of accelerating change, rising complexity, and increasing competition in the world marketplace, you can expect to make at least four career changes in your life. And there's a good chance that one or more of the companies that you work for will be acquired by a more aggressive one, or will become non-competitive, or will be forced out of business altogether. And big organizations are just as vulnerable as small ones. That's why you must never stop learning and never complete your skills training or your personal and professional development. You must become a lifelong learner to remain in the game as a valuable player. So view yourself as you incorporated and incorporate your mental assets. By building your book value through continuing education and by raising the value of your own stock in yourself, by investing in skills training to anticipate change, you'll continue to be sought after as a one-person service corporation by employers who will compete to retain you and to buy from you. So from now on, treat yourself as you incorporated, and you'll always be in demand and command the highest price for your own brand of excellence. Winning key number five, become a proactive innovator. There are four basic modes of thinking in today's society that individuals have adopted and embraced. 30% of the population are victims of the system in their own minds. They are inactive, and they wait for someone to save them, or they wait for the next catastrophe. 50% or half the population are survivors or sustainers. They see themselves swept along by environmental and market conditions. They take one day at a time with no real game plan or goals. They are reactive, and they wait for a trend, a problem, or a change to occur before they react with a decision that will sustain them. And 10% of the population are dreamers. They're active, dreaming up new ideas in the shower every morning that will change the world or make them successful. They are very active, but they never really get out of the shower, dry off, and take action on their ideas in time to catch a trend. And finally, there are the 10%, like you, who are the innovators. While the victims are inactive, waiting and dreading, while the survivors are reacting and hanging in there, and while the dreamers are in the shower, active but non-productive, the innovators are out of the shower, dressed, ready, and proactive in the market. The innovator for the 21st century has the visionary's ability to look ahead, the philosopher's ability to learn from history, the inventor's ability to employ breakthrough concepts, 
and the entrepreneur's ability to deliver those concepts profitably and effectively to the marketplace. To win in the 21st century, you've got to become more of a proactive innovator by anticipating change, yes, even welcoming change, and ride the front end of the wave while it is still building and curling. Be a trend spotter and be a wave rider right into the 21st century. Before we discuss the next five winning keys to success in the 21st century, let me share with you a few more reasons for my optimism about our world. Instead of becoming paranoid about the dangers of nuclear fission as an energy source, I'm really getting turned on by the potential of nuclear fusion. It may be possible that the technology of laser fusion will combine the properties of the laser with deuterium tritium and water to give us unlimited safe power in the near future. The prospects of one sixteenth of an inch of San Francisco Bay powering the western United States for 350 years is not a pipe dream. And hydrogen may well be the fuel to power our private and commercial transportation vehicles of the future. The most exciting aspect of hydrogen-powered vehicles is that the exhaust from these engines burns cleaner than the air above the Canadian Rockies. It may be possible that our great-grandchildren will drive the freeways in millions of hydrogen-powered cars, like little vacuum cleaners, that will suck the smog out of our cities and release exhaust fumes of pure oxygen. Just think of Los Angeles residents. They'll be able to see the mountains of San Bernardino from downtown L.A. for the first time since 1949. Your great-grandchildren will stop by to visit you and listen to you reminisce about the tough old days in the 20th century. They'll listen in amazement and ask you, you mean you used to drive cars that burned dinosaur remains back in the old century? And you'll reply, we sure did, kids. Things were tough back then. We used to have to drive to school. And they'll look at you wide-eyed and gasp and say, you mean you went to school? And we'll say, you're darn right we went to school. Our parents and grandparents even walked or took a bus to school. We had to drive to school. But you kids, you sit on your rear ends at home with your voice-operated computer terminal linked into the Apple 2000 orbiting library and the IBM data station. You just sit there and play educational games. Back in the old days, we used to play those same games in arcades. We called them Pac-Man and Frogger. And the kids will shake their heads and say, Boy, you sure did weird things back then in the last century. You know, by the year 2010, it will be a common sight to see hand-wringing parents sending their teenagers aboard the airport-launched supersonic transports going off to Hong Kong for the senior prom. The kids will still be wearing rented tuxedos and new formals with corsages. The trip will take under two hours from San Francisco to Hong Kong, and we'll give our kids the usual admonitions. Now stay with the rest of the prom group at the Peninsula Hotel with the chaperones, and don't go sneaking over to Australia for the after prom like your brother did last year. I expect you home by 6 a.m., at the latest. <laughs> Some things will never change, will they? In addition to laser fusion energy, hydrogen power, and orbiting airliners, there's also energy from alcohol, energy from deep thermal rocks beneath the strata of the Earth. We're busy converting coal into petroleum, harnessing energy from the sun and from the wind. We've got new voltaic cell battery power, magnetic energy, and even garbage power from recycled waste. You know, we're very fortunate that electricity was not first used as a weapon or destructive force. Had the first product of electricity been the electric chair or a lightning weapon, you can be sure that today we'd all be afraid to plug in our toasters and appliances because of the way the media concentrates on the negatives rather than turning problems into opportunities. You see, the same type of technology at Los Alamos Scientific Labs that Edward Teller and Oppenheimer used in the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, is now being used to split the atom into even smaller particles for the benefit of humankind rather than for destruction. The linear accelerator at Los Alamos and other research centers is splitting the atom into minute particles 
called mesons and pimesons, which have a very, very short lifespan. When these particles are propelled into the human body at the exact location of a tumor, there's a good prospect that the radiation treatment will destroy the tumor without affecting the other organs of the body adversely in the process. And thus an invention for destruction has been converted into an invention for saving and lengthening human life. And that's why I'm so optimistic about the future. We are turning crises into positive opportunities. Now let's talk about the second five winning keys to the 21st century. Winning key number six, learn to be an intuitive manager. Now's the time for whole brain thinking and decision making. Thousands of years ago, we were more emotional and intuitive. As we learned how to use tools and communicate, we developed into a left brain society, utilizing verbalization, logic, and practical step-by-step -step solutions to our problems. The technological progress has been staggering, and we seem to have accomplished more in the final 50 years of the 20th century than in all of the previous years of history combined. And this is just the beginning. The computer and voice-operated terminal will make the electric typewriter as obsolete as a butter churner in a few short years. We have a tremendous opportunity for a new age of creativity. As the professional and personal computer take over many of our analytical left-brain functions, our time and our minds will be more available. We should be able to experience interpersonal relationships based more on feelings and emotions than we have been in the past. We'll become intuitive managers. With our sharpened right-brain awareness, we'll be able to sense the precursors and the beginnings of problems. We'll notice body language, hidden agendas, nuances and subtle trends. And because changes will occur so rapidly, we'll be able to integrate bits of incoming data and quickly match this data with experience we've stored in our minds. Using both sides of our brain as a partnership, we'll match our head analysis of a problem with our gut feeling or right brain intuition to make the most effective decisions. And because we will have learned to relax and simulate we'll be able to instinctively recall and perform winning moves. All it takes is more awareness and more practice. Winning key number seven. Strive for excellence, not perfection. You know, there's a common belief that certain achievers do everything right that they never make mistakes and their plans never fail. There's the presumption that only if you're perfect and perfect all the time, only then do you have the right stuff to succeed. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. Successful winners in the stock market make money on only two out of five investments. And actors and actresses who are today's superstars, they were turned down 29 out of 30 times after auditioning for dramatic roles or for commercials. Psychiatrist couches are filled with people who can't bear a moment of failure. Rather than try and endure and maybe succeed or maybe even fail, these individuals choose not to try at all. They fear that the slightest setback will topple their exacting standards. What they are really saying is, I'll never be perfect. I am not perfect, therefore I am not worth the effort to be the best I can be. Throughout my own life, I've learned that nothing will ever be attempted if all objections must first be overcome. If you want to write a book, don't spend ten years trying to make it the perfect statement of your beliefs. Complete it in one year, and keep the reader in mind when you write, and write something the reader wants to know. Writing a book is like painting a barn, not a Picasso. It's better to go out and get the barn painted and get busy rather than view your work as a masterpiece that must be agonized over. Set a deadline to begin and another to finish. Writing a book or achieving a goal is the same as writing a term paper in high school or college. We really don't get motivated to start writing until the due date pressures us into action. To win in the 21st century, you and I need to get a strategy for approaching our breakthrough ideas and goals. We need to decide what is most important for our success. 
Then we need a comprehensive database, and when we have the research done, we need to ask ourselves two vital questions. Is this an idea whose time has come and gone? Or is this an idea whose time may never come or will come too far in the future? We need to remember that finding a niche or a new market takes more time, effort, and capital than filling an existing niche or current market. We need to check our priorities to make sure we're doing the right things in their proper sequence. And finally, be prepared to sell your ideas to an indifferent world. In this fast-track society, in which change and competition are accelerating, you'll find that most people, even in your own close quarters, will be so busy following their own game plans and their own instincts that they'll appear to be aloof or unresponsive to your great concepts and innovations. Unless you can illustrate dramatically and quickly how what you're doing benefits them, you'll find that you're selling your ideas to an indifferent world. That's why you don't want to hesitate and wait for the perfect moment. There just isn't one. And never give up. Persistence is the winner's edge. If you're in sales or have friends and associates in sales, Listen to these startling findings from the National Sales Executives Association concerning sales persistence, and listen very carefully. You'll be as amazed as I am. Eighty percent of all new sales are made after the fifth call to the same prospect. Forty-eight percent of all salespersons make one call and then cross off the prospect. Twenty-five percent quit after the second call. 12% of all salespersons call three times and then quit. And guess what? Only 10% of all salespersons keep calling. And what do they get? They are the highest paid people in the world, along with a few celebrities, corporate captains, and professionals. The 10% who persist get the real payoffs. They collect the dividends on what all the others invested. Welcome to the top 10% club, the ones who persist and go for excellence not perfection. Winning key number eight, you are your financial security.